I'm really sorry if y'all hear the squeaky freaking chair. I just bought this chair. It was supposed to be brand new and lovely and it's not. And I'm going to give them one hell of a rude Amazon review as soon as I can. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my channel. It is me, your girl, Tracy. I'm back. I'm back on camera. So you might hear a lot of edits in these future videos. You'll be able to understand what I'm trying to say, but YouTube does not like when you talk about certain substances, so I will have to edit those out. Let's go ahead and get right into this recap. So we have Cindy here, and she's waiting for Jennifer to come out of the prison, and she's here with her friend, Richard. Jennifer gets out of prison. She's excited. Cindy's excited. Everybody's excited. Jennifer is very grateful. Jennifer is grateful that Cindy took her in. She says that if she didn't, she doesn't know where she would be. Cindy is excited to see Jennifer. And she's excited to see what the future holds. I don't like what I see in the future, Cindy. And Jennifer says, meeting Cindy, she seems fun to be around. So Jennifer puts her stuff in the bag and she says to Cindy, you know what you can do for me? A cigarette. Cindy says quite concerning that she wants a stimulant right out of prison the young ladies i will not call them the h words anymore i was just being funny last week i don't really yes i mean i really don't think if you're free that makes you a hoe i was just joking i'm really sorry ponytail after calling annalisa the b word left her house and mark follows them out and they're asking him like what are you gonna do are you gonna stay here are you coming with us unfortunately for mark his prison or rather the terms of his probation state that he can't just go to anybody's house and do probation. He has a set residence that he is, you know, he's in, on the books with. And so he cannot just get up and leave. He actually has to be here with Annalisa and Veda. He has to just get over it until he can find another place to put down. Annalisa is sitting here with Veda and she's saying, do you believe that Mark had the nerve to ask me some disrespectful mess like that. Could he have women sleeping in the room with him? You know, Mark's already halfway in the house and he's asking to have two women stay in the house. I don't even know these women. This is not a brothel. Mark says he has no idea why Annalisa is upset, but she ruined his entire day. His place, like I just explained, has to be pre-approved by the parole officer. So he's stuck in that stale room with no television. Some things I just have to play for you guys to hear because if I said what they said, you wouldn't even believe that they said it. I don't expect any respect from him, but I'm going to continue to be respectful. What? I don't know what to say to that. Annalisa says that they're just trying to help Mark and, you know, get his life together. And she doesn't need this stress because he's disrespectful. Veda, you really need to choose your words a lot more carefully. I'm not ready to wash my hands because the young man needs help. I give him 10 chances. That's what you give uh, kids in special ed. So Mark decides to bring his raggedy behind back in the house because he ain't got nowhere to go. He's homeless. Disrespectfully, might I add talking about what you think I'm coming in here for. Like, who do you think you're talking to? I think you're going to have your clothes and your box or rebox or whatever the hell that box is you brought in the house. I think you're going to have that outside my door. If you don't, I don't know, shut the hell up. Mark knows that he doesn't have any other place to go. Mark knows that he can't go anywhere else. So he is sucking it up because it's a free place to live. I wish you would realize that and learn that. OK, it's this arrogance that Mark has that's going to keep him in trouble. All right. He feels he deserves more than he really is worth. Honestly, Annalisa, I know you settled when it came to Veda. I'm really sorry. I am really apologetically sorry, but I can tell that you settled for Veda. You ain't have no man and you didn't want to be single. So you was like, eh, he'll do girl. Veda be talking crazy all the time. Okay, so Veda says, after Mark came in and went to his room or whatever, Veda's like, this actually makes me more excited. What are you, a glutton for punishment? What, what, the, what is wrong with you? Like, excited for what? Excited for what? After Veda says, I'm excited, this makes me more excited. And Annalisa says, excited for what? And Veda says, to work with him. Veda, what are you, a social worker? Who the hell you think you are? Like, who do you think you are? Annalisa says that she's freaking 
pissed. I don't know why Mark didn't stay his ass in his bedroom, but he decided to come out and say, I don't even know why she talking crazy. And then Annalise is like, OK, so you're going to come in here talking crap now. So Annalisa says, I'm just taken aback that you ask me if these ladies could stay here. I just find that totally disrespectful. And Mark says, I ain't got nowhere to go. So you ain't got nowhere to go. Why are people who are homeless always want to take in strays, huh? But I'm just saying, why, why do people that don't have places to live and they're living in their car, why do they have dogs in the car with them and cats? I've seen it. I'm not making it up. I don't understand that. There's just a bunch of things I just will never understand because things are common sense. And let's be real here. They don't teach common sense in college or school or high school or trade school. After Mark says he doesn't have no place to go, he said, what kind of person would I be not to ask you? Mark says, and what kind of man would I be if I left my holes in the street? And what kind of lady would you be yeah, if you did the same? Mark feels like Annalisa is being unreasonable. Mark says the girls had no place to go. How he going to leave them outside like that? So where did y'all go to do y'all party of three? Where did y'all go to do that? You can't stay where you did it at? Hmm. Interesting. I don't believe in transactional relationships. Okay. I really don't. But if y'all doing all that, y'all all three can get together and arrange some housing. I'm just saying. Annalisa says, no, I'm not entertaining your women. Okay. In my house. So Mark tells Annalisa that she's trying to ruin his first day out. You know what would really ruin your first day out? Sleeping outside. Annalisa says those girls are not her problem and what she says goes in her home. Mark's response to that was well, sounds good, man. Annalisa says nothing that Mark is doing is saying that he wants to progress and move forward and do better for his life. Annalisa imposes a curfew of 11 o'clock at night and Mark says he can't do it. He's a grown man he is a grown a grown man he says he can't do it but so mark says to annalisa you're running a prison says let's compromise 11 o'clock is way too early and then veda says why don't we do it like this why don't you do it for like a week you know come in at 11 o'clock for a week and then we'll lighten up as far as the curfew veda says just the fact that mark came back means that he wants to be there no no it means that he needs to be there he has to be there he can't go anywhere else and veda says if he wants to be here he needs to follow the rules annalisa says no i don't think a week is enough time try two weeks mark says stop and annalisa says i don't like the fact that you was talking crap to me mark thinks this is utterly ridiculous and annalisa says if you can't do two weeks i'm out mark reluctantly just agrees Mark actually says that he might be able to give them two weeks of 11 o'clock curfew, but we all will see. So Mark gets up and leaves and says, you just run everything over here. Yeah, exactly. You know, when we have a household and a place that we pay mortgage and rent, we are literally dictators of our residences. Veda does not think that Mark's going to keep this curfew. This morning, Marisol, I ain't going to be saying it like that all the time, so don't get used to it. I'm sorry. I, you know, rolling the R is not easy. Jim and Marisol are headed early in the morning to go get Mickey. Jim says to Marisol that Mickey claims to be saved, sanctified, and full of the Holy Ghost. And we will see how his actions line up with the word of God. Okay, don't get me started. Don't get me started. Marisol is nervous about it and she doesn't know what to expect says that they have helped a lot of other people, but Mickey is actually the very first person who they are inviting into their home and right out of jail. It is the unknown that has her a bit concerned. Jim says the consequences of Mickey screwing up is not going to be good for him. Mickey is looking at 20 plus years for his other charges. Jim says Mickey cannot fail, says that they are hopeful for God's will to be done and for Mickey to make a change in his life. Marisol and Jim go to pick Mickey up. The officer says that Mickey has holds and warrants in Hamilton County. 
Marisol asks the officer if he has any idea about how long that would take. And the officer says there really is no set time. It can be any time. The officer says that Mickey's supposed to have video court sometime today. Jim decides to ask the officer, what has Mickey been in jail for? The original charge was evading arrest, driving on revoked, aggravated assault on the first responder, and evading arrest again. Jim says that Mickey told them that he had a violation of probation on two theft charges and the manufacturing of... Okay, so he has a lot more charges that they did not know about that Mickey did not reveal to them. Jim says to Marisol that Mickey didn't say anything to us about any of that. Mickey must appear in court today before being released. And after he's seen by the judge, he will be transported to a nearby county to settle additional charges there. Now, I know how people feel when they're reading voiceover stuff, trying to look at the camera and also trying to read. Marisol says that now they know that Mickey has a charge for violence. Jim says that Mickey, a police officer, and was not forthcoming with them about that. Marisol says before she was okay with it a little, but now they're asking themselves, do they want to bring him to the house? Jim actually asks the officer his experience with dealing with Mickey. And the officer says that he's had quite a few evading arrests and uh mickey pretty much likes to run marisol says that it concerns her that mickey has a reputation as being a runner she says because mickey is coming straight to their house from jail she's wondering if mickey is going to be running out of there in the middle of the night and girl if he does whose problem is that that's the that's the hamilton county's whatever county that is that y'all live in that's their problem that's mickey's problem that's not going to be y'all problem if he decides he wants to run marisol says she feels like she can't trust mickey the officer says to jim and marisol that if something happens he'll let them know marisol says that she's disappointed that mickey wasn't honest with her and so is jim so they're going to stick around for a little while jim says that he wants to hear what the results are Jim hopes that God works a miracle within the next hour or so so that Mickey can get out. Aaron is in here getting his praise on in the room. David is out here like, I had no idea he was a Christian. Like, Aaron used the word goofy to describe David. And I gotta say, the word goofy fits perfectly, okay? So David was saying that he woke up this morning and he actually has somebody else with him. It's going to take him some adjustment to get used to somebody else living with him. Aaron says he loves singing. He was singing about being a changed man. I don't know that song he was singing, Jow. David says that Aaron wakes up and wants to sing to the world, but he doesn't want to be woken up by singing. Were you not already awake? So what the hell are you complaining about? Shut up. That man wants to sing. You let him sing. He happy to be free. And if you're new to my channel, welcome. Welcome. Like, comment, subscribe. Thank you. David says, hey, do you want some breakfast? And Aaron says, sure, just give me a minute. And he comes out. He has all this bacon and all this wonderful stuff. Aaron says to be able to cook real food is everything. Aaron says he doesn't remember the last time that he had steak in jail. They have like chicken steak. And he says it's like ground up squirrel. Aaron says to David, I think we can add bacon in every meal. And David says it's not kosher. If it's not kosher, why is it in your house, David? I'm not understanding why you're offering to feed this guest breakfast and you're serving him something dietary wise you cannot eat. Being courteous? I don't know. Seems like I don't know. I don't know. I don't I really don't understand it, but at least Aaron got his bacon. Aaron says that he does not know what kosher means. Well, it means certain food laws, you know, like you're not supposed to eat pork. David says that he grew up Jewish, so he's not accustomed to being around religious Christian people. Aaron is not playing with you. He is saying grace and praying over his food. I just realized that I'm not on camera, but here I am now. I'm really sorry. I don't tell you. Okay. David says he doesn't really pray before eating. He had no idea Aaron was into religion like that. And why does it matter? Nobody said you had to pray before eating, David. Nobody said you had to worship um, the Lord and pray in the name of Jesus. Aaron asks, we're getting along together and everything. What are your expectations of me while I'm in the house? David says that he would like open communication and you're definitely responsible for the people that you bring in here. He goes into telling Aaron 
about keeping the house clean, yada, yada, yada. Some people do need to be told, even though they're grown. David says there, there's things that need to be done in the house. And Aaron jokes, yeah, things that you will be doing. But yeah, he was just joking. So Aaron continues on and says, My expectations. I'm not a conversationalist after 10, period. It's kind of like how I was in prison. Like I go in my room to not talk to people. Aaron says he thinks that expectations go both ways and he had to tell him what was up. And if the door is closed to his bedroom, if the bedroom door is closed, politely F off. David asks Aaron, is there anything that he should look out for? Aaron says the biggest thing for him is sobriety. Aaron tells David, be mindful of it. It's been a 20 year battle. He says, it's always his opponent. Aaron says, so if he does reach out needing help about it, he doesn't need David like nagging him or coming down on him about it. David says he doesn't know what he would do if he found out that Aaron was using in the house. If it got to that point, he wouldn't be able to stay living there. Aaron says his biggest insecurity is the fact that there's no lease there. And David says, that's intentional. He's like, here you don't have a lease and that's intentional. And at first I was like, eh, yeah, yeah, you. Aaron says that he doesn't want to mess this opportunity up. He is pretty much at David's mercy, but he ain't kissing nobody's behind. Aaron tells David, no lease is intentional, but don't put my stuff out on the street. Aaron says that goes from having issues with your roommate to now having an enemy. David says talking with Aaron, he thinks that there is a lot of trust that needs to be built. David says there are a lot of things that he assumed about Aaron that are not the way that he thought they were. He says there's always a possibility that Aaron will burn a bridge with him. David says to Aaron, if there's something that I'm doing that annoys you, I just want you to tell me, you know, let me know so I can stop. Aaron says, if there is a situation, let's just, you know, talk about changing the living situation at the end of the month so that. So it's not a, you know, I'm burning <laughs> almost out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Aaron, you going to burn the house down? David, this might not have been a good idea for you. Veda says the way that Mark spoke to Annalisa, his wife, yesterday was disrespectful and wrong so he's going to take him to this hookah bar to smoke and ask mark to apologize to annalisa keep in mind even though mark is going to apologize he still believes that he's not in the wrong mark doesn't think that it's a big deal for him to hang out for three days after being in prison for almost eight years and he believes that annalisa is a blocker So now we're here with Daniel and Kathy, and they're basically going back over the scenario of when Daniel went down there to get Devin and how he flipped the script and decided to change last minute and stay longer with family. Devin, as you can see here, if some of you can, you're in the kitchen, you're cooking, I don't know what the hell you're doing. I'm going to tell you what it says. Devin must check in with his parole officer in Texas by the end of the day tomorrow or risk going back to prison. To make it in time, Devin must leave his sister's house in Colorado first thing in the morning. So now we're here with Devin and his sister Carissa. And she comes in the room to tell Devin that she has to go to work and take the kids somewhere. I don't know. And if he could just mow the lawn. Devin says it's his first day out and he's just chilling up inside the room and it's stressful. He says it's stressful because he still has to drive from there, Colorado, to Texas. Devin says that Carissa gave him a brother do list she basically gave him a to-do list and when he was in prison his sister held him down so he feels that he owes her at least this Devin tried okay he tried but that lawnmower apparently is a piece of crap he's messing up their lawn Devin says that he knows Kyla from when they were kids he actually met Kyla in a halfway house and she's still freaking trouble, huh? Devin says they love each other at the end of the day and they're always going to be close. Devin says that him and Kyla used to be in a real relationship. So Devin asks Kyla, where is she? And she says her house. And so Kyla wants him to come over there, but Devin is fighting temptation 
of mass proportions because the area that she lives in is the area where he used and all that bad stuff so he knows this although he wants to go he resist temptation and he does not go one of the reasons why Devin did not go to Kyla's house is because he didn't want to disrespect his sister Carissa comes home she comes in and she asks Devin what are you doing and she asks about the lawn and girl I'm gonna tell you something you know you acting like he didn't do nothing and just watch the video he tried he really did try give that give that guy some credit for trying Carissa accuses him of being high Devin says that Carissa is overreacting because she doesn't trust that Devin can stay sober. So Devin says this to Carissa. He says this is the reason why people get because when they're not getting they're accused of getting so they figure might as well get and he says to her I did not get high. Devin says that he was tempted to go see Kyla but he didn't want to put himself in a position to fail. Devin says the more you talk the more I don't care you can't keep telling me to do stuff because then I'm not going to want to do it. This is why she didn't want you in her house. Carissa says, I can tell you what to do while you're in my house. Carissa says, it's easy for an addict to push you over and turn two-faced on you. Carissa says to Devin that she wants him to do the right thing when he goes to Texas. Carissa says, when you go to Daniel and Kathy's house, they are nice people. And, you know, the rules, I'm trying to help you you know follow rules here because the rules start here when you go to their house you're going to have to follow rules as well Devin says to Carissa I understand sis I understand so Devin apologizes for not doing what she asked him to do and Carissa accepts his apology Carissa says that she feels that Devin is in transition being a young person into society and now he has to learn how to follow rules and now he has to learn how to follow Kathy and Daniel's rules and she hopes that he succeeds. Daniel says that he's ready to get his life together. He's looking forward to this part of his journey. Devin feels that he needs to get away from this familiarity of the environment in order for him to succeed. We are back at Meigs County Jail. I think I said that right. Thank you very much. And we are still waiting for Mickey to come up out of this jail and go home with Marisol and Jimmy. Jimmy says that Mickey has all of these additional charges that they didn't know about and it throws up a big red flag to him. He says because what else is there? He has not been totally honest with them. So after five hours of waiting, they finally have word on Mickey's case. So the officer says that he just got word that Mickey's case is going to be postponed, which is about two weeks from then. And so he's going to have to do an additional two weeks until his case. Officer lets them know Mickey will not be getting out today. So Jim says that it's disappointing that Mickey will not be getting out that day. And he has to still wait two weeks for this case. And um, he, for some reason, has to be the bearer of bad news and tell Mickey. Because Mickey supposedly, supposedly, doesn't know all of this. Like no one's informing this man of what's going on. I doubt that seriously I'm so sorry I doubt that seriously so Jim has to let Mickey know that he has to be in jail another couple weeks and there's nothing they can do about it so Marisol and Jimmy they go ahead and they call Mickey and tell him what's up about the two weeks and Mickey didn't seem phased by it in the least they think that he probably knew so Jim was playing this game the Jimmy Jimmy Jim whatever uh, they, he was playing this game basically with Mickey like do you think there's is there anything that would keep you from coming out today like trying to get him to admit to the extra charges so I don't know if they're showing these things like out of order because he came out Mickey came out and said I have a hole in Hamilton County I could have sworn in the other episodes that we watched that they already knew about this hold he didn't even get specific so he didn't even really tell them anything new jimmy goes on to let him know hey you know you're gonna be here another two weeks like i said he took it well and that was that we're back in vining minnesota with cindy jennifer and richard cindy says with jennifer she does not know much about her past so cindy asks jennifer what was she initially arrested for and it was the sales of jennifer says that it was a setup jennifer explains there was some type of sting where somebody was set to call her ask her for substances and she went down there to sell an ounce and little did she know 
the person had a wire on them and boom she ended up in jail jennifer explains that it's a struggle that never goes away cindy says this is the first time she's hearing about jennifer's history cindy says that she feels like jennifer has a long battle ahead of her and cindy says yes it does make it a little concerning cindy says to jennifer one of her concerns was jennifer having stimulants like cigarettes and then cindy says it might be a red flag that things would go back to the way they were jennifer said no you're talking about triggers and what would trigger me cindy asks jennifer how would she know if jennifer is relapsing jennifer says if they have a disagreement or argument and she's getting snappy with her she says that it probably will be best to sit her down and ask her if she's being triggered cindy says that she does have a couple cans of hard iced tea in the fridge and she asks jennifer does she think that having those in the house is going to be a problem so about the iced tea jennifer says that would be a great question to ask her parole officer jennifer says this is a lot right now being questioned by cindy she's just trying to enjoy her freedom although cindy is missing one of her legs i forgot which leg sorry child but anyway she's missing her right leg child don't make me go backwards but anyway she's missing even though she's missing one of her legs she does have a prosthesis that she wears so if you guys see her walking that is wise because she has a prosthesis on one of her legs so anyway as she's going to the bathroom you have richard and jennifer are left to talk jennifer asks richard if he's worried about this situation a and e knows when somebody's mumbling thank god okay richard says he doesn't know but he does know that cindy expects a lot sometimes it's gonna be a little rough for a little bit jennifer says that she's a little bit worried about what cindy expects from her she says that she knows richard does a lot of things for cindy which is going to fall on her end of convo because cindy's back so cindy says with my disability do you plan on helping me around the house with bills other things i don't know who the hell cindy thinks she got a live-in slave or whatever the hell she got but um ma'am you need to hire a home health aide that's what you need jennifer says absolutely i absolutely will help cindy i don't like you you're taking advantage of a woman in need and i don't like it I don't like it and I don't like you. Cindy says, well, Jennifer's moving here. I need somebody to clean the basement. I need somebody to clean the garage. I need somebody to wipe my ass. She didn't say that last part. I am. And that's what she's expecting, ain't she? You know what, Cindy? You're utterly disgusting. If it's one thing I do not like is y'all taking advantage of someone you know is in a situation where they depend on you. Some people do not know how to deal with the, pow the power that they get from helping somebody. There's a nice, warm, toasty seat for you in the depths of hell with your daddy Satan, okay? Just to let you know. She's expecting Jennifer to clean the basement, garage, pay bills, okay? Jennifer says, well, first of all, I gotta take care of myself, okay? I come first, okay? Me first, me first. And everybody else after jennifer says if if cindy thinks i'm gonna be mother f and cinderella up in this piece she has another thing coming jennifer literally agreed with what she said even though she didn't fully agree with all the cleaning crap and cindy says to her do you think this is going to be a free ride cindy she's going to end up beating you with your prosthetic leg i i don't want it to happen okay that that is not what i want to happen on this show I am simply telling you what's going to happen if you mess around with Jennifer. And how dare you say that to her on her first day back out in the free world. You're going to ask her, I hope you don't think this is going to be a free ride. She literally just agreed with what you said. She said, okay, I'm going to contribute. I'm going to help you do whatever I have to do. And you got the nerve to say this to her. Annalisa says last night she went to bed completely exhausted and frustrated. Her frustration is with Mark and there's a lot of tension in the house she says that you would think that somebody would be grateful for a non-family member to invite them to stay inside their house mark comes with this fake apology this is mark's ploy to play the game so that he can have a place to live until he can find someplace else to go mark's sorry apologies if i made you feel some type of way you already know how i feel about this type of apology if i made you feel some type of way Veda literally told you that Annalisa was upset about it. 
So you did make her feel some type of way. And you should apologize sincerely. Don't apologize to me if you don't mean it, damn it. Okay, sincerely apologize. Annalisa says that she appreciates his apology. She was very taken aback yesterday with what happened, but she says her and Veda have the best of intentions for him. Annalisa says that Mark doesn't have social skills. He is a little boy in a man's body because he's been in jail for eight years. Okay, majority of the time he should have been growing up and learning those social skills. He was in prison. Obviously, he didn't learn how to open his mouth all the way when he talks either. Annalisa says that she's willing to guide him. Annalisa says to Mark that their goal is to teach him how to be accountable and show him what that looks like. Mark says to Annalisa that he's glad that she stood her ground and he needed to get his mind right anyway. Annalisa says that it's good that you realized you were doing something that was going to take you backwards. Says to Mark, you asked me when you got out of prison how to be an adult. Annalisa explains to Mark that she doesn't want him to get into the wrong crowd. There's a lot of guys out here getting, you know what I'm saying? And so she doesn't want him to be one of those people. Annalisa asks Mark if he thinks that he'll be able to abide by the 11 p.m. curfew for two straight weeks. Mark says, absolutely. In other words, yeah, right. Annalisa says that when Mark came in with this disrespectful attitude, she was ready to kick him the hell out. She says, but Grace has sustained him she says that she's not willing to give up on mark she's going to give him another chance to prove that things are different annalisa says time will tell if his apology was crap or not well, mark says so you accept my apology so we can move forward she says when you're talking to somebody you need to look them in their eye they end the conversation with a hug and mark says this is how you finesse finesse sorry don't name your baby for Ness. And if you do, you better tell me because it was my mistake. OK, Mark says the hug was just a way to finesse. So she thinks he's such a nice young man. Mark says you have to move like that sometimes to get in a better situation. Devin has been out of prison for three days and it's time for him to start driving and heading to Texas. Marissa says don't squander this opportunity. And Devin says that he loves her. He gives her a hug and he's on his way. So we already know that Devin is on his way to Texas from Colorado. Um, he has until the end of the day to meet with his parole officer in Texas or he'll be going back to jail. Devin says that he does not regret spending extra time with his family. Devin says what he's looking forward to most in Texas is getting a job and being around other good people. Devin says he's worried about driving alone. It's a long drive. He has no time to waste. Devin says if he doesn't get to his parole officer in time, he could be violated right away and then he'll lose everything. Oh, Lord, while he's driving, the freaking check engine light goes off and starts beeping. So he checks the engine and now it's it's overheated, as you can see in the back of him. Devin says if he has to go back to jail after being out only three days, he's going to be devastated. But I thank you all for your patience and watching my video. And I have way more videos coming this weekend. I have a teen mom next chapter recap coming. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching my channel. Make sure you like, comment and subscribe. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Bye.